Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Think Red, Act Blue, Hacking Proprietary Protocols. My name is Jessica Gallifs of SANS, and today's featured speakers are Ismail Valenzuela, SANS Certified Instructor and Senior Principal Engineer at McAfee, and Doug McKee, Principal Engineer and Senior Security Research <coughs> excuse me, Researcher at McAfee ATR. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time, and Ishmael and Doug will moderate them towards the end of the presentation. Please note that this webcast is being recorded, and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be made available for viewing later and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Ishmael. Excellent, thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy to be uh, here with uh, Doug, with my friend and, and colleague from McAfee as well, talking about a very fascinating subject. And if, if it sounds intimidating, right, don't worry, we're gonna make it super easy for you. And we're gonna give you a lot of uh, tools as well. So uh, without any further delay, let's uh, jump into what we're gonna be covering today. Typically, you see me looking at uh, blue team challenges, right? Or talking about blue team, talking about defense. Uh, that's what I've been doing, as I say here, defending all the things for 20 years. In reality, I started as a pen tester, a red teamer. I didn't tell Doug this. This is a surprise for him. <laughs> but uh, not um, on I always say that I stopped, you know, hacking things because it became boring because it was too easy, right? Well, this is not really true. There is, you know, some challenges that are worthy, and and this is one of those. So. Um, I always prefer to say that I'm, I'm purple, right? I like to think red and act, act blue. But the reality is that I, I enjoy to see things with a defensive uh, mindset. So today you're going to see Doug, you know, how his brain works, which is amazing when he looks at packets and things that he has to see on a daily basis in his daily job as a researcher. And it's going to explain to you how his brain works. And we're also going to see the tools that you can use to make that work. Uh, easier and we're going to be approaching that problem from a red team perspective and from a blue team perspective uh, so hopefully you're going to enjoy that uh, you uh, you can see I'm a SAS certified instructor I'm also co-author of the class uh, security 530 defensible security architecture and engineering and that's my um, uh, our twitter handle so feel free to follow us you're going to be finding a lot more over the next uh, few weeks and months related to this to this topic and with all of that uh, to you, Doug. Thanks so much, Ismail. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here and be able to share some knowledge with the community. Uh, I'm opposite of, of Ishmael. I've uh, been hacking most of the things for most of my career, but he also might not know that uh, I've spent plenty of time in a SOC uh, defending as well. So we, we both have a, a, cross, uh, a cross knowledge there, and that's what we hope to bring to the table here today. Nice. But uh, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and, and jump in here. And what exactly is it that we want to talk about today? Well, we want to start uh, kind of unpacking this concept of proprietary protocols. And like every good presentation, we'll start by defining what we're, what we're looking at here. So when we say proprietary protocol, we're talking about a protocol that hasn't been well defined by the industry. It's typically something used by a vendor for a specific purpose. Uh, there's not usually an RFC you can find online. You're not going to find stuff on Stack Overflow talking about this protocol, right? This is something that is completely unique to a specific use case. And what's important here is although these are unique protocols, they typically have common traits. And that's really what we're gonna focus on today is we're gonna talk about some of those common traits you can look for in these protocols to help whether you're a red teamer or a blue teamer. And the reason this is important uh, is, for, is for both sides of the coin. For, for, red, for red teamers or nation state actors, uh, this is something that typically is less reviewed. And as it's less reviewed, there's a lot more vulnerabilities pre present, uh, which they can leverage. And then of course, on the blue side, because there's no documentation, these kind of become mystery protocols on your network and they, they often get ignored. Uh, and so what we're trying to do here is let's, uh, let's hope that we can help you ignore them a little less and give the red teamers a little bit of a harder job and also show the red teamers how they can use this to their advantage. What a lot of people don't realize, right, is that when you get some of these proprietary protocols, uh, you put one of those PCAPs into Wireshark, Wireshark is not going to tell you anything, right? It's just going to yeah. 
show you the hexadecimal, they ask you dump if anything, but that's it. So it's and that's, that's what, and that's what we're going to show you today exactly how uh, daunting that task can look like. And uh, just just from the the red team perspective, this is this is typically what you see uh, an attacker or a security researcher go through as they're changed for for leveraging these vulnerabilities, right? First, we start with dissecting the protocol. Then we move into fuzzing, which is just sending malformed data uh, up from the packet where we're looking for a crash. Then they're going to analyze that crash and write an exploit. And, and truth be told, this each step here could easily be its own college class or, or week-long uh, presentation. And where the interesting overlap lies is that very first step of dissecting protocols. And that's what we're going to dig in just a little bit here today. And uh, Ishmael, what, what do you feel about how dissecting protocols in, is in the blue side? Well, you know, I've been uh, using Wireshark for many years as well, even teaching uh, traffic analysis uh, through SANS for, for many years. And I have to say that these days we have tools that are pretty amazing that blue teamers are starting to adopt, but they're not that well known by, by the community. So when I was thinking about how to approach this, this problem from a blue team perspective, well, I thought uh, one, one approach could be just like get something like Zeek on the network and network security monitoring, right, a sensor, uh, that could sniff those those packets and then you put them into uh, some tool that you can use for analysis. For example, Elastic Stack with Kibana dashboards. That's actually the approach we show in, in Security 530. And maybe you're more familiar with that type of approach. So what I thought is like, why don't we explore the data with a tool like uh, Pandas Data Frames, which are just like two dimension dimensional data sets. It's just like a matrix where you have rows and columns, just like a spreadsheet but you, manipul you uh, manipulate that with Python. So with Python code, you can do that. If you put that Python code in a Jupyter notebook, which is nothing but just a, a browser, right? a web browser where you can run the code, uh, break into snippets of code, so you can essentially explore what the data looks like. You don't have to know much coding. You will have to know a little bit of Python, right? But not a lot of coding. And the good thing is that we are actually sharing all of this with you. Now, you wanna build it from scratch, you can install on Visual Studio, you can install Anaconda that comes with all of the libraries, all the dependencies. That's what we have been using, right, uh, Doug and I, to, to build this uh, our presentation. But we're also sharing with you, and let me do that real quick, right? So if you go to, if you go to, not to this, <laughs> there you go. Uh, if you go to the um, sh uh, to the links we're going to be sharing with you, our GitHub repos, you will find this launch binder. Uh, this launch binder will create a Docker container where all the code is going to be run with all the dependencies, and the end product will look like something like this. Uh, just make sure that when you look at the Jupyter notebook, there's a little button here that asks you if you want to trust the code. You will have to click on trust it to get to execute all of this. But these are the snippets of code, just standard Python. What we're doing is we're going to read the PCAPs with SCAPI, which is a network manipulation library for Python. You can use this to generate packets, and, and Doug will talk to you more about how to do that and the scripts that he created for this, and also to ingest packets. We get these packets into data frames, which are just like matrices, and we analyze those you're going to see the results of that analysis pretty pretty soon. So now after saying this, Doug, what are the steps we're going to be starting to, to take to analyze uh, uh, this traffic, unknown traffic that we just found on the network? Yeah, so what, what, we've, what we've tried to do here is break these down into overarching concepts that apply broadly across you know, different proprietary protocols. In fact, you could even apply these steps to, to regular or known networking protocols to, to do some analysis. And really, again, this is a pretty deep subject. So for today, we're really going to focus on the first four things that you see on the top of this slide, uh, with uh, also including the documentation by Scapy at the, at the end of this. Um, Documentation uh, is one of the least favorite things in our industry, but I hope to show to you that uh, by doing a little bit of documentation on by code, you can actually learn more uh, about your protocol that you're trying to dissect. So let's uh, let's go ahead and, and dive right in here uh, to the the first the first uh, concept, and that is what I'm calling simplifying the scope. Uh, it doesn't matter what I'm presenting on. Uh, I always have, especially junior researchers uh, in the industry, ask me. 
where do I start? Like, I, I never know where to start on a concept. And that's what we're really going to spend a little, a good amount of time on this presentation talking about is how do we, uh, how do we narrow the scope down to something that's manageable? So if you, if you're a red teamer or a blue teamer, you know, you see this traffic going across the network, you open up a PCAP file, this can be a pretty daunting task. You know, obviously this is just a small snippet of, of packets in a PCAP, but I mean, we can be looking at hundreds to thousands of packets. And when Wireshark shows you this and doesn't identify anything except for the fact that there are TCP and UDP packets, you know, where, where do we get started? How do we make this something that's more manageable? And before I go too much further, let me mention that uh, for the purpose of this presentation, uh, all the, the protocols, PCAPs that we show are completely fictitious. Uh, we engineered a fake proprietary protocol for this presentation to have characteristics that we've put together from things that we've seen in the industry that are pretty common. So you won't go find this. You cannot go hack this on a vendor. You can try all you want. Uh, if you do find it, I'll be very, very surprised. So but we're going to take an approach here where we gradually get deeper and deeper into these packets. So the first thing we want to do is we want to do some general observations on just looking at this overview screen here that Wireshark provides us. So if we go ahead and make just some really basic, in fact, you might think these are almost too basic observations, but bear with me because this will help us narrow down what we want to look at. So in this traffic, we have both TCP and UDP traffic in the same conversation. So in, in one stream to and from a, a potential two devices, we have two types of traffic. We also can see some unique port numbers. Uh, this is uh, extremely common in proprietary protocols. They don't use your common like 80 or 21 uh, type port numbers. You see things that you don't recognize. The other thing you'll, you, you might notice is the majority of the traffic is flowing one way. So we've got traffic go mostly being delivered from IP address ending in 140 to 135, especially if we follow the push packets, the ones containing most of the data. Another context clue here is that uh, 135 is the device that appears to be listening on that port 1234. So because it's listening and the port sending it that data is a higher port, most likely a random generated port, it kind of gives us the, a pretty assurance that one, what 140 is a client and, and 135 is a server. Is, is that 100% accurate all the time? Absolutely not. But again, we're just trying to narrow down the information that we have using context clues. So uh, Ishmael, looking at this very high level approach, um, what are some basic things you might do to dissect this outside of Wireshark so we don't have to be staring at this, uh, this matrix? Yeah, so as you know, Wireshark will give you uh, the summarization of the connections. You can see some basic statistics that can give you an idea of what's going on. And that's definitely the, the first recommended uh, uh, step. But since we have the data now in a, in a data frame, what we can do is to apply certain uh, basic analytics, statistics, and visualizations. And you're gonna see throughout this, the presentation, there's places where the visualizations are gonna make a lot of sense and they're gonna you know, uh, uh, simplify a lot the research process. All the times they're just going to be like, yeah, it's okay, right? So one of the things you're going to learn from this is there's no one single method or one single, well, I think there's one single method, which is what Doug is explaining, but there's no one single tool. There's a number of tools that can make your, your life easier. So for example, let's let's have a look at this and I'm going to try, I was just telling Doug that I think we, we had to sacrifice a couple of packets this morning because uh, um, this is going to be done live. <laughs> so I'm going to be running the snippets of code. You, you can do this yourself, right? Anytime you go to the Jupyter, uh, binder with the notebook and you can do this but I'm doing this on my local machine this works great when you're doing an exploratory analysis of uh, data on small data right because all of this data is going to put into memory so it has to fit in, in memory of this of this machine but I ingest the pcaps I use this function to put all the pcap data into the data frames I'm not going to get into explaining each line of code but I put lots of comments and hopefully it's going to be kind of self-explanatory what's going on here. Uh, it's just taking the fields with Scapy, putting those fields into columns. And in fact, just to show you pretty quickly, if I do something like DF1, this shows what we have in this data frame, right? So we have the number of packets for each pickup file that we're ingesting. In this case, pickup one is in data frame one and the number of columns, including the payload, right? So we're going to work with, with that. 
Now, very basic visualizations. I'm aggregating by protocol by and by source. I count the result of that, and then I get to see that we have most of it is TCP traffic. That's protocol number six, as you know, right? 43 packets out of 50. And then protocol 17 is UDP. All right, what else do we know? Well, Doug observed that 140 seems to be the one sending most of the data, and then 135 seems to be the one receiving most of the data. So that's confirmed by our uh, visualization. And we can also aggregate by destination port and payload. So we can see that port 123 seems to be doing or receiving most of the data, sending and receiving most of the data. And in this particular case, right, destination port 1234, protocol 6, we know that this seems to be the port that's receiving most of this uh, data as well. So that's kind of the uh, observations that we have we have made and that we can we can see here. Now we know there's TCP and UDP. Let's have a closer look at that. Uh, what can you show us, uh, Doug, about this, these two transport protocols? What else well, do we have here? So we, we want to continue on our, our path here, of narrowing down what we really want to dig into. So we want to keep isolating it one step at a time. And so, as you said, we're going to we're going to jump into just TCP for a minute. So again, you might be in a PCAP file with hundreds of thousands of packets. So we want to first look at just these TCP packets, and we're going to isolate based on the push flag, which is what you see in the Wireshark filter here at the top. Now, why is a push flag important? Um, in case you don't know, the, the push packets for TCP is where actually the data is contained. Almost every other packet in the conversation for TCP is going to have to is going to be dealing with redundancy and reliability. Uh, so this is where the data is. And if we look at just these packets and we sort uh, we sort them by length, we actually can quickly notice that there's three different lengths and one of them is repeating. Now, this is one of those concepts that you know it works. Sometimes, not all the times, but it's a good again, it's a good place to start. And a lot of times with different pack with different packets in a proprietary protocol, length is, is almost a delineator of different types of packets. So we want to make sure that we look at one of each type of these different lengths and start our analysis there. It doesn't mean it's going to tr necessarily transfer to all of them, but again, it's a good place to start. The other thing we want to take notice here on this screen is that. Uh, again, the majority of the traffic is going from 140 to 135, but we have one packet that's going from 135 to 140, and it's the only one of that length. So we kind of we might have a, an interesting uh, request and response thing going on here at, that's outside of TCP uh, because we have one unique packet going the other direction early in the conversation. And actually, off the screen here, too much to put on the on the slide. There's actually one additional packet of a different length at the end of the conversation. Um, so now if we move on to doing the same type of analysis, just looking at UDP, um, well, what, what we see here, obviously, we don't have any other filters besides UDP. There's no such thing as, as push packets to narrow down by. But if we use the same type of analysis, these are all of the same length. And they're all going from the same source and destination port. And if we kind of combine that together, we can, we can make a assumption that if we look at one of these, there's a good chance they might all be at least the same format. So we don't need to look at each one uh, right up front. So if we look at, we pull one of these out, we also can notice, again, we have a unique thing here where 135 is only sending one UDP packet, and here's at the very end of the conversation. So uh, so that's that's generally what we've got for just looking at UDP and looking at TCP, taking it down one one step further. So if since length is a good place to start, Ishmael, how can we do this same use this concept in Panda? Do, can we make any additional observations? And, and this is where uh, it's going to make a lot of sense, right? Once you have the data in the data frames, you can do things like this, and I'll show you in a in a second, right? Just keep an eye on that length 78. That's what Wireshark is reporting, right? For all the UDP packets, 78 bytes. Now, if I go to the code and I have a, a data frame, all I have to do is to run a filter like this. Just give me a subset of the data frame where the column protocol matches 17. That's UDP packets. Look, the minimum, right? Minimum, I'm going to try to do some annotations here. Minimum 64 bytes, maximum 64 bytes because, well, we know all of the packets are 64 bytes in length. But hold on a second, Doug. Didn't you say that it was 78? Wireshark said it's 78. 
What's now, going there, on? Might, there might be some interesting thing we need to think about between when we're using different tools, right? Because different tools might be reporting yeah. different lengths. So what is the length that you're measuring? So it's not that my, my code is, is flawed, right? It is not. <laughs> it's that That's Warsh right. is actually showing you the entire ether, Ethernet uh, frame, which includes 14 bytes for the frame header, right? The Ethernet frame header at layer two. So Warshak shows you those, those 14 bytes. This uh, scapy, right, when, when got all of this data, didn't uh, take that into account. So that's why 64, right, plus the 14 bytes, you get 78. So we're, we're essentially getting the same conclusions. We're not getting anything additional for now, but remember, we're just exploring the data, right? It's not about the code. It's just about exploring what we have in here. For protocol six, now we have some additional statistics, minimum size, maximum size. But we can also visualize this, right? And that's when it starts to become even cooler because we can see, yeah, all the packets are 64 for UDP. For TCP, we see the majority of the packets are 164. Again, you could even do this on the command line with TCP dump, right? And then some uh, Unix command line kung fu. But these visualizations are going to be very handy in just a few minutes. When we plot all the packets, there's 50 packets. And yes, we start counting of zero, right? With these type of structures, just like with packets, we always start counting from zero. So first packet, second packet, we see all the packets and we see the length. Let's keep a, 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 our eyes open, right? And think about how you could use these visualizations to learn more later on. And, and we'll show you some cool tricks that we can do with, uh, with this. All right, so we narrow it down. We know that there's TCP, UDP. We know there's only one type of UDP on these four types of TCP packets. Where, where do we go from here, Brad? Right, so now that we've, we've simplified our scope to something that's a little bit more manageable, um, and again, that doesn't mean that this is gonna determine every single packet in this list, but we're, we're looking for a place to start. And by breaking this down into four different lengths or what we're calling four different types, it gives us a great place to start. So what we have on this slide is we're gonna take, keep taking this one step further. So now we understand the flow a little bit, understand the overview of the conversation a little bit. Let's figure out what these packets actually contain inside of them. So we're gonna focus on these payloads. And so what you see on the screen here is we've ordered the payloads of the four different lengths that we're interested in uh, from smallest to largest. So you have two of the TCP payloads, one a UDP, and then you have the largest uh, TCP payload at the end. And what we're gonna do is start comparing bytes. We're gonna start looking for similarities between these different type of packets. And what we're gonna start with is the shortest packet. And the reason for that is uh, packets typically, or yeah, packets typically layer information. So if we can learn what the shortest packet has in it, there's a good chance that that knowledge will apply to the larger packets as well. Again, is that 100% time the case? Absolutely not. But the, if we start and we can figure out what all of the bytes are in the shortest one, then when we move to the larger ones, it'll be less daunting to take those apart because there's a good chance we'll have some context clues of what the rest of that information is. So here, if we look on this slide, I did some highlighting in different boxes to just see some general comparison between these packets. So we can see pretty clearly here quickly that the first four bytes of each packet seem to be identical or very, very similar. And then we've got the second two, uh, two bytes that they, they're not the same. They're almost, they might be incrementing in some sense. So maybe they're a counter, um, but they're a similar format. And then if we wanna look at the last seven bytes of the, of the shortest packet, the top one there, we can see that these bytes are existence in three of the four pack packet types. And in the first two, they're in the same position. So this is an interesting place to start uh, doing some comparison to figure out what these bytes might be. Now, Ishmael, we know there's no easy button here to magically determine what these bytes are, but I have a feeling you might have another way to look at this. <laughs> yes, and, and let me uh, pause here for a second. I see some, some questions just to maybe some uh, people uh, join later uh, during the missing introduction. But remember what we're doing here, right? Imagine it's, it could be a red teamer or it could be an adversary. They just like landed on network and just sniffing and they find there is traffic between two systems. They wanna know what that traffic looks like and they find out, well, it's unknown, right? Warsh doesn't know anything about it. It's, it's, it's a proprietary protocol. Or you're just like looking at your network and with something like Zeek with an IDS like Surikata, 
uh, or just net flow data. And you find out there's two systems that they talk to each other, but you don't know that, you know, what they're talking about. But you know there might be special systems. These might be IoT devices, they might be industrial control systems, right? So you sniff these packets and now you open them up in Wireshark, and that's what we're trying to do here, right? Either with Wireshark or with data exploration with uh, Pandas, uh, data frames, or Python. Now, since we don't know what's in the payload, right? We already identified layer layer four, uh, TCP, UDP. What's in the payload? When when we were thinking about this, I, I thought, well, you know, something we could do is to just split the payload in groups of bytes, and then see if there is a um, a pattern there. If there's a specific group of bytes that repeat n number of times. So for example, you can take a, a group bytes by two bytes, all the two bytes chunks in the payload. How many times does a specific uh, a chunk of two bytes repeat? So we did that with uh, several uh, uh, iterations, uh, different uh, groups of bytes, two bytes, three bytes, four bytes. When you do it with four bytes, something like this shows up in the code, right? Uh, this is very interesting. There is a chunk of four bytes that repeats a lot. Now, these are the four bytes. We don't know what it is, right? None of them. We don't know what it is. But there is one that repeats a lot. Isn't that interesting? If you look at the code, right, it's very, very simple. I'm just going to show you really, really quick. Um, let me show you here, right? We showed all of that. Remember, you can run this code anytime you want. This is the function return list of bytes. I'm passing an argument of four bytes. You can change this to anything you want and then do this analysis. We just put it into a series and then we run the visualization and it fails because I have not run everything before that. <laughs> right? There you go. You have to run these things in, in sequence to initialize the variables, but you can see that repeats a lot. So my question here is, Doug, is there a way to determine what these bytes are? What do they mean? What do you think? Yeah, and, and it's great that through the visualization now that we can identify something that if we can figure out what it is, it applies to the majority of the packets in this. So again, it's a way to kind of kill a lot of birds with one stone. And what, what we're going to talk about now is a, a common thing that we see in a lot of proprietary protocols, um, something called embedded networking. If I can get the slide to switch. I'll, I'll pass there it. There, there we go. So. Uh, and, and what embedded networking is, and this is a, a term that we've coined, uh, is proprietary protocols typically restate networking data in their payloads. Uh, it might be IP addresses, it might be port numbers, it might be MAC addresses. One, one reason for that is sometimes these applications that are ingesting these protocols or devices, they don't have access to the lower layers. They're not getting that information from the, the operating system. And so they re-embed this networking data so they can utilize that in their decision making or their analysis of the traffic coming off the network. Well, one way to kind of cheat at this and to figure out if there is embedded networking data is to simply look up in the packet in Wireshark. Wireshark may not understand the layer that you're looking at, but it definitely understands the layers above it. It understands the IP layer, the ethernet frame, all that stuff. So when we have a, um, a, a value of four bytes that is repeating as often as we're able to see in Ishmael's visualization, if we look up further in the packet, we see that same value exists there or, or, some, or a value very similar. We can simply rest our cursor on it and Wireshark is able to tell us that, that this is in fact an IP address. So now we've identified what one field is and this field is very predominant in these, in these PCAPs and we can check that off of our list. So this is actually a concept that uh, I find so often that uh, we actually wrote a script to help analyze this information. So this is on the GitHub that we posted a link to earlier. It's an extremely simple Python script. Uh, all it does is takes in a, a PCAP file and it searches the payloads for uh, every four bytes for something that would translate into an IP address. Now, if you're paying attention, you might be like, hold on a second. There's a lot of four bytes that would translate into an IP address. And you're absolutely right. If you run that on its own, you're going to have a lot of false positives, for lack of a better word, like things that aren't really, that don't really matter. Where the interesting or the important part of the analysis comes in is typically if it's a val if it's an IP address in a proprietary payload, it's going to match an IP address that's also in the P in the PCAP in the IP layer of it. 
So what this script does by default is it searches for IP addresses in the payload, and then it looks in the PCAP for valid IP addresses in the IP layer and tells you if there's anything that matches. And so here you can see that we ran the script on one of our generated PCAPs, and it pops out the first two find times it finds uh, those IP addresses and says, hey, these might be IP addresses embedded in your payload. Um, so what do we get if we take this concept of IPs matching in the IP layer in the payload? What do we get if we add that knowledge to Panda? Good question. So let me actually show you, right? I'm going to go to the, to the code here. And we have a function that searches for IPs in the payload. That's the first thing we, uh, we do. Let me actually show you what that looks like. And I'll go back to the, to the code here. So you can see this is the function. This uh, creates a new column where we can put that, uh, those uh, IPs. We put this into a series and then we count right, the number of occurrences and we show the top 20. So this matches what we saw before. Right, the first four bytes in all of those packets, uh, it matches actually this IP 192.168.7.140, and it's always embedded in uh, that position. But how do we know it's always on that position? Well, I run an additional filter to just look at the ones that are included in the header. That's what Doug was mentioning. Typically, you see those IPs in the payload matching the IPs in the IP header. But we can also see that this IP typically, let me see if this works. And of course, it doesn't because I will have to run everything again from the beginning, right? To initially say, uh, to initialize all of the variables. So if you're doing this by yourself, make sure that you've run all of the previous snippets of, of code. And I'm gonna go to that here. Right. So now it run all of this. See that it's actually running it right now. But you can see the positions and you can see where they, they show up, the number of times they show up and the position within the payload. So let's go back to the slide. And we can see that this IP is always in position zero right, in the first four bytes. And it happens uh, to show up 24 times. So again, this is just exploration of, of the data. And this is just one single field. But I'm sure there is more to see in these packets. Where, where can we get this information from, Doug? Yeah, sometimes you uh, you get really excited when you figure out one field and then you kind of get upset when you realize that you know, you've got 178 bytes to go, right? So how, how can we continue doing this analysis? And, and we've started a little bit down this next concept of enumerating patterns, but we're really gonna take that to the next level now as we analyze each of the, the bytes in the payload. And we're gonna continue to only focus on our shortest uh, our shortest packet for a moment. And you can only glean so much information by looking at one instance or one conversation of a proprietary protocol. Really where you can start to learn more information is if you have multiple captures of the same events happening over and over again. So what we're gonna do is we're now gonna do some cross analysis and see what we can learn about the, the, the bytes in these payloads if we look across multiple PCAP files. So here we have that shortest TCP push packet, the first one that shows up uh, in, in the PCAP file and we have it against three different generations of the traffic. So before, we're pretty certain now that we know the first field is an IP address. We still don't know what the second field is. If we look at that second field now across multiple PCAP instances, we notice that it's not changing. It's the same value. That doesn't tell us what it represents, but it's an important fact to know that across conversations or across streams, it's not changing. So we can use that to our advantage potentially in the future. The next, we look at the last seven bytes. Now, previously, we thought the last seven bytes were the same in every in, in these different packets across one PCAP. However, when we look across multiple PCAPs, what we notice is that only two of those seven bytes are staying the same, and the other five are changing. And it just happens to be that out of the first two bytes, the numerical value is five, and there's five bytes preceding it. This is another concept in networking that's pretty well known, and it's something that proprietary protocols also use all the time. And that is when you have a length field potentially prepended or postpended to a bunch of bytes. And here, since we can look across multiple conversations and that field is not changing, there's always five bytes after it, and those five bytes are changing, it's a pretty good clue that this is a length field, especially now that we're at the end of the PCAP, and there's, or I'm sorry, not end of the PCAP, end of the packet, 
and there are no more bytes preceding this. So now we're going to get to everybody's favorite part, and that is documentation. Uh, my team jokes with me about this all the time. I, I tell them way too much about documenting, but bear with me here for a little bit, and I think you might find that this will end up being useful. We're At not going to document, word document, right? At least it's not a word document. It's exactly. Cool. It's, it's cool documentation. It's cool documentation. We're going to document using code. Everybody likes code way much better than those office products that we have to deal with. So. We're going to use Scapy here to document what we're learning. I mean, if you're anything like me, if this was the first time you're looking at all this information, I mean, we're what, 30 minutes into this presentation and you're trying to remember what every byte of this packet was. So let's write it down in a context that can help us. So if we use Scapy uh, to, to do this, and unfortunately I don't have time to go into all the mechanics of Scapy, but we'll just give you a quick overview. This is a class defining a packet that we've discovered. And so we're just going to use some really basic naming schemes, call it first packet, and we're going to write down what we know about each field. So we've got the IP field. Uh, we've got some unknown field that's a short. We know the next one's a length. We don't know what it's a length of, and we're going to write that down in Scapy code. And then we're going to do something called bind layers, because in order to use a, a class or a Scapy layer, we have to tell it how to connect to the other layers in the packet. So in this case, we're writing on top of TCP. So we have to find something that is unique to this protocol defined in TCP to connect our two layers together. Very commonly, this is done with port numbers. There's not a whole lot else you can connect with in TCP, and port numbers is often what's used. That's the same way that Wireshark identifies, oh, it's port 80, it must be HTTP, right? That's because it's binding based on a port number. So we're gonna do that here, and I'm gonna come back to this in a little bit, and you'll see why this is increasingly important. So, now that we have this scapy layer, how do we use it? Again, another very short snippet of code. We can actually read in the PCAP file with scapy, and we can look for any packet that matches this criteria and print it out to the screen. And so what this does, it helps us organize our thoughts. And as we make changes and learn new things, we can edit these scapy fields, and we can see exactly what's in these packets, and it can parse this for us. Um, and if we look further down the road, let's say we get a, a much fuller understanding of this networking traffic, uh, Scapy can be used to help fuzz if you're a red teamer uh, with these layers. As a blue teamer, you can use these layers to help write detections uh, in order to identify this type of traffic. So it becomes very useful very quickly. So if we continue down the analysis of a new looking for different patterns, we, we are still trying to determine what is this last field that's in our shortest packet. And, and we've looked at it across the same PCAP. And we've looked across it, uh, at it across multiple PCAPs of the same packet. But now we need, want to combine those two things and look for comparisons across uh, different, uh, two different packets in the same PCAP across multiple PCAPs. That might sound a little confusing, but I promise it's simpler than it sounds. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the shortest packet and then the next shortest packet within the same PCAP and across PCAPs. And you can see this enumerated on the slide here. So if we look at it across PCAPs, the last five bytes are changing between different PCAPs. If we look at it across the same PCAP, it's not changing, but it's the same within PCAPs. So this, this is typically representative of something that's unique to a session. So that means it, it might not necessarily be a session token in the pure sense of the word. The, the application might be using this for something completely different uh, than a session ID, but knowing that it's unique to a session is important as we continue to further our analysis. So we're going to go ahead and make the assumption that this is some sort of session specific value. And now we have pretty much identified all of the bytes in the shortest packet. Well, lucky for us, if we take those same, those same 13 bytes and we look at the second packet size, we notice that we already know what those 13 bytes are. And there's only two more bytes we have to identify. And again, this is why we start with the shortest packet length hoping that this information will continue to carry forward. So now we have two bytes in the second packet type or second shortest one that we don't know what they are. And I wanna introduce a concept here. It's, it's really easy, um, especially for me, to get zoned in to these bytes when I start doing this analysis and forget about everything else that's going on around me. And it's important to not, when you run out of bytes in a packet and there's a value there that you don't know what it is, in this case, we have three in one of them and one in the other, it's important to zoom back out and look at the two PCAPs in comparison to see what else we can learn. So if we do a, a broader comparison approach and we just look at PCAP one and PCAP two, 
and we keep in our mind that we have a value of three and one that we don't know what it is, just looking at this, this data side by side, you can quickly pick up that, hey, these UDP packets are not spaced out evenly. Remember, I mentioned that in the er earlier one that they were spaced out evenly within a PCAP, but across PCAPs, they appear not to be spaced out. They're not the same. And, and that's, that's intriguing. And if we investigate that, what we'll notice here with the idea that three and one are the two numbers that we don't know, um, that there's a chance that these are counters. And counters are very, very common in protocols. They're counting something. You just have to figure out what they're counting. Well, here there happens to be three push packets between each UDP. And on the other side, there's one push packet between each UDP. So we can maybe make an educated guess that these values might be representing how many TCP packets are being sent from the application's perspective uh, between each UDP packet or, or maybe a uh, status packet, uh, which, uh, which, which we'll, it's kind of what we've coined here as like a heartbeat packet. Uh, it's very, again, it's very common to see these packets that in middle of stream are sending out some type of status or some type of keep alive packet. And so we, we like to use the term of a heartbeat packet. And because this is common, is, is there a way, Ishmael, that we could take a look at this and actually maybe easier identify this heartbeat versus just staring at these Wireshark uh, values? I'm glad you asked me that because what I was thinking right now, it's like, if you eat packets for breakfast like Doug does, right, and, and you see the matrix like him, you're looking at all of that, it's like, oh yeah, I can see they're evenly spaced out. And I know what most of you are thinking is like, what the heck, right? I, I don't, I don't see that. How do you, how do you see that? Well, if you spend a lot of time with packets and you, you feel the packets, you see the packets, you may eventually see that. But is there hope for anybody else's, you know, that that, that doesn't have those magical skills? Sure, visualizations for the win, right? And that's where it really makes sense that we brought all of these data into the pain, uh, depends data frames. So it's just like, a, you know, if you were putting all the data into an Excel spreadsheet and just like do visualizations there, but with the added benefit that now this is code. So you can change these visualizations without having to go crazy with formulas or anything like that. Let me actually show you what that looks like in, in the code or in the Jupyter notebook that we have shared with you. All we do is to plot, see all of the different data frames, DF1, DF2, DF3, and DF4. And there you go. I'm going to zoom out so you can see the four PCAPs in one single visualization there, right? So can you see the heartbeat? I think it's pretty obvious, right? In this particular case, PCAP1, it's evenly spaced. Every seven packets, packet 7, 14, 21, 28, it's the heartbeat. You can see packet two, it's you know more frequent. Uh, sorry, not packet two, uh, pick up two, pick up three, more spaced out. That's, I think it's a very you know cool way of finding that you have the, the heartbeat, the heartbeat there. Yeah, so, when, when Ishmael showed me these visualizations, I was like, I may, might need to start using this more because uh, that is, that's, that's one of my favorite ones. It's really easy to see what you got going on there versus staring at the packets. Right, absolutely. And, and think <laughs> about this as a way to, to do this not only with Panda data frames, but at scale, right? Maybe with something like Zeek and, and some of those dashboards that I mentioned before. Now, now that we have this, what do we do next? Well, we do your favorite thing, Ishmael. We have to document what we just learned. So right. we're gonna go back to Scapey and we're gonna write down what we just learned about those heartbeat packets. And what we'll find here is that as we start to create our second class for this second packet, is that really we're only adding one more field. So that's interesting is like, wow, there's a lot that's the same here. And then this is where Scapey really forces us to do another level of analysis is we have to bind these layers at the end. The problem is now we have two, two different packet types that we've enumerated and the, uh, there's only one, they use the same port number. So what are we gonna bind the second layer to? If we try to bind it to the same thing, it's just gonna overwrite the first one and it's not gonna be very useful to us. Well, this is where we need to notice that we have these common fields and we need to start pulling apart these layers. And so if we go back to that first slide where I showed all four of the different packet types, uh, what is it changing? Right here, yep. whoops. 
<laughs> so if we go back to as we get the slides here figured out I'll go, I'll go back to that this one yep. there we go yeah so we've got uh all, all these four different packet lengths on this thing on the slide uh if we were to use all of the common fields from only the first two packets we would actually eliminate quote unquote one of our packet types which might not be an issue if we were only stopping at those two different packet types but since we know there's two other packets that we want to analyze it's beneficial to us if we can find something that's common between all of the different ones that we're interested in. So if we look on this screen again, it's pretty easy to see that the first two fields are the same or, or present at least in all four of the different packet types. And if we pull those out and create a, a, a header class, then we're able to potentially attach the rest of it using that information. So if we now go and continue to update our documentation and we pull out those first two fields, we can now bind on the fact that we know that this second field, remember that was not changing across uh, PCAPs. It was the same across PCAPs for the packet types. We can now bind those different lengths using that field. So that's what we end up looking at here for our documentation. And, and that, that just goes to show how by coding this up forces us to learn just a little bit more and analyze our, our PCAPs a little bit further. So we've actually thrown quite a bit of information and deep analysis at you here. So we're, we're gonna wrap up with uh, one of the easier concepts or things to identify in proprietary protocols. And that's something using uh, clear text to your advantage. So if, if you didn't notice before, that UDP packet had some ASCII values in it. And ASCII is a great place to start to try to figure out what's going on in a packet. Um, and the other thing to think about ASCII values or clear text values that are in a packet is most of the time they're variable in length. Uh, unless you see a pattern, you know, a, a word or a phrase or a set of numbers that is always the same length, you're likely going to need to find a length field to identify how long that ASCII string is. And so if we look either before or after those values, you can pretty, most of the time you can find something that matches the length of that field. So that is the case here. We find a length field prepended to our clear text values. And remember, we already know what the first, we already know three other values in this, in this packet because we've discovered them with the other, the TCP packets. We know what the first, the second one is. We also see that, that session ID in there as well, or what we're coining as a session ID. So we've actually already determined a large port of what, a portion of what this bytes are in this packet. And, and, and now begs the question, what is this string? I don't know if it sticks out to you or not. It did not stick out to me the first time I looked at this, but they just like look like random numerical values. Well, what could that possibly be? I've got a couple guys on my team that often make fun of me that I do things the hard way or um, and I'll bang my head against the wall for no reason. And they, uh, they've, they've gotten me to realize that sometimes the best thing you can do is take clear text values and simply just Google them. And Google will tell you magic rather quickly. So if we take these values and you Google them, they immediately pop up as uh, geographical coordinates. Now, again, maybe you recognize them as geographical coordinates. It's not something that I was able to recognize on the first try, but Google tells us that pretty, pretty quickly. That's a very good spot, by the way, too. Like, <laughs> where you landed. <laughs> well, you know, we do our best to pick the best places. So now if we go ahead and we update our documentation with this, this new knowledge that we have, of course, remembering that we have this header field, um, you can see that even though we only found one more field out uh, by looking at the clear text values, it led us to a length field and then knowing the other values that we discovered in our other TCP packets and that they transfer over during our analysis, we've actually almost completely understand what this, uh, what this UDP packet is containing inside of it. Of course, there's still a few fields that we don't, but we've got the majority of it. So we go ahead and we code that up, and then we um, and then we bind our layers appropriately, and we've got another working scaping model. Now, I'm sure knowing that geo coordinates is a very uh, mappable and visual thing, there's got to be something we can do to make this more interesting uh, in the panda world. What do, what do you got for us, Ismail? Yes, I got a couple of things for for you. So let me show you. If I go down to the code, right, I'm going to make this bigger again. First of all, I will um, go, you know, try to benefit from some of the um, automation that we have here, knowing that there is geo coordinates embedded into this code. I can go through all the pickup files 
and I see some questions. We're going to address those in a, in a, in a few minutes. Please keep them, keep them coming. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, with this for loop. I'm going to just print all of the UDP payloads. And those we identify, they are the heartbeats, right? So as you can see, for pickup number one, and I could change this to pickup two or three or four, run the code snippet, and I will get to see all the geo coordinates. So for pickup number one, it doesn't change, but there is other coordinates in other pickups. So what I do here, it's very simple. I just go through all of the pickups, all of the packets, and with a regular expression, yes, you know, you are waiting for this. There's a like a very simple regular expression, just trying to match these geo coordinates. We extract all of those from the payload, we put it into a list, and we just plot them. So just so you can see the result of that, this is the list of geo coordinates that repeat across all of the different um, pickup files. So if you just uh, use, so in this case, I'm using volume, right? You plot it into this uh, Jupyter notebook, and then you can see all the different locations, right? You can zoom in and see exactly where these are located. Now, based on your experience, uh, Doug, where, where do you see this happening in proprietary protocols? This is like, I don't know, security cameras, or what type of devices will do something like this work? Sure. Yeah, we, we actually we actually find geo coordinates or geo or location data embedded in, in lots of different types of devices. Uh, we've we've seen it in in uh, ICS systems, uh, things like building controllers, for example. Uh, we see it in camera systems at times. Um, there's all different types of, of protocols that are speaking out where they're located for for management purposes. And so it's definitely something use, useful to look for. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, in conclusion, in, in summary, we have talked about you know a lot of things, but I, I think the most important thing that you need to to think about from from this talk is there is a method to the madness, <laughs> right? It feels very intimidating when you see like a, a traffic that you don't know how to identify. Warsh doesn't know anything about that traffic. We have presented here a method to to do that. Of course, we could have like you know talked in depth for this on this topic for days, and eventually we might do right. Uh, at some point, but this is a skill that is very useful. And it is useful for you know, reverse engineering traffic for malware analysis. We see malware, right? In our day job, we see malware doing sometimes not a full protocol uh, uh, from scratch, but sometimes like you know fields and things inside of a payload that are different that, that, one, that what Wireshark can uh, interpret, right, or decode. So this is a very useful skill for that. ICS networks, IoT devices, medical devices, and we have also given you, uh, well, quite some tools to be able to, to do that. Um, we, we're sharing everything with you. You have everything, the Python code, the pickup files, and I will explain how you can use your own pickup files with this in a, in a second. But stay tuned, follow us on Twitter, right? So full metal packets and about security. Uh, we're going to probably do more uh, sessions on this. What I would like to know from you guys is if you find this useful, right? let us know, communicate with us, engage with us on, on Twitter. Like both of us were very responsive there. And uh, hopefully we can see you sometime soon and we can uh, show you more about how to do these this specific things. Is there anything else, uh, Doug, you want to mention before we jump into the questions? No, I, I think this is great. I think we should uh, go ahead and it sounds like you've got quite a few questions over there. Let's let's dedicate some time. Yeah, to that. we got some of those. Very nice. All right. So we have uh, Mark. You asked about real life scenario. How would you come to the conclusion that the UDP traffic and the TCP traffic are even part of the same protocol, right? So that's what I mentioned before. I, I answered. I think I answered that. You're going to be sniffing the traffic, right? With Wireshark, with TCP dump, with your IDS tools, uh, and you you realize there's something there you don't know about, and you're going to you're going to analyze it, and that's where you start looking at at the protocols. Well, I think I, I can add there too. I think part of the confu uh, part of the uh, confusion there is, you know, it's not super common to see TCP and UDP being used by the same application at the same time, and so I think the question focuses around like, why would you even think that that's a thing? Uh, and, and and that's a great question. And I think some of the things is using those context clues. Uh, that we talked about in the very beginning of the general observation and seeing that that traffic is going with the same flow and then when we when we look at the the deeper analysis inside of, of the payloads noticing that all the similarities that exist from the tcp traffic uh, and again it's not a foolproof system 
But the reason I put that in there as two different types of, of TCP and UDP traffic is this is a thing that we see uh, is being used. And we don't want to forget about that in our analysis that sometimes two protocols can be working together. And it doesn't always have to be TCP and UDP, um, but it's, it's definitely something worth considering during your analysis that uh, it, there can be more than one stream uh, talking on the same, using the same protocol. Very true, that's, that's a very good point. So we have a question from uh, Piyush. Uh, how can we tweak the code to put live traffic into the code that you showed in the presentation? So this is a the difference between what you can do with something like, let's say, Zeek, right? And um, analytics platforms, UABA, SIM, right? That type of platforms that can do like, you know, machine learning and some visualizations. This is just to explore data. So this works well with, let's say, a number of PCAPs that are not huge because the limitation is that you have to put all of these data in memory, right? So what do you do is you, you put Wireshark, right? Or to, to sniff or TCP dump or something like that. I'm actually gonna show you the, uh, the Jupyter notebook. And as you can well, see here, yep, go, go ahead. I was gonna say, while you do that, uh, this would not work at a large scale at all. So do not mistake what I'm about to say, but uh, Scapy does also have a sniff function. And what I have done in the past in a controlled environment where I don't have millions of packets is I have written those scapey layers that I showed you and fed that to the sniff function of scapey to be able to uh, interpret packets in real time on the network. Now, as I said, that's not going to scale, as Ishmael mentioned, from a memory perspective, because that's all being done in memory and scapey is not a router. Uh, so, uh, but it, it would give you a sense that you could replay real packets or take a small subset and, and do it that way. Exactly. Yeah. So this is more data exploration, right? You're not going to do this at scale. This is just data exploration. And then you can get these lessons learned and go to your uh, enterprise, you know, uh, systems, IDSs, IPSs, architect this to have this type of visibility. That's where I would like to do as a blue teamer, right? I want to know what I have on my network. And that's why these skills are, are going to be useful. If you have some PCAPs that you want to ingest here and, and run this, um, you know, code on it, this is how you do it. You, in this case, this is all taken out of our, um, um, you know, GitHub. So it's built there. You have the PCAPs here, but you can do this with your own GitHub repo. In this repo, we have proto hacking. We have all of the uh, data that you that you also need, and you just change, right, the path in just the PCAP, and and run it. And all the data is going to go into these different data frames. And if you know a little bit of Python, it's not really difficult, right, to adjust all these different things, just like uh, iterating through different packets uh, or iterating through different PCAPs and changing the uh, variables, looking at different columns, uh, etc. So that's that's definitely um, doable in a lab for the purposes that we're discussing here. Pascal, uh, couldn't you get to this faster by looking at packet interdistance at an early stage? Doug, you want to comment on why your, your methodology and looking at the distance of packets towards the end? Oh, well, I'm not sure what this was in the question. Um, if, I think it's talking well, about why do we do the uh, the analysis of the heartbeat, the interdistance between the packets at the end of the process, right? Versus doing it earlier uh, in our yeah, analysis. The, the process we outlined isn't necessarily step by step. I think the important thing that we were trying to do in the beginning is really simplify our scope to answer the question, where do we get started? So it's, it's always important to narrow down what we're looking at so you're not, you don't get overwhelmed. Is, is there any reason that you couldn't have identified that there was a heartbeat earlier in the, uh, earlier in the process? No, absolutely, you could identify that earlier in the process. Where we got there was, is the heartbeat was important when trying to identify a specific value in a specific packet. And we started with the shortest length packet, so that way we could reuse anything we learned in the additional packets. So it, it took us a little longer to get there, only because the second uh, shortest packet is the one that had the, the counter that's referring to the heartbeat. That doesn't mean you can't identify the heartbeat sooner, um, especially if you're experienced at this. You know, the, the, when, I, when I open up a PCAP, and I see that as evenly spaced out, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a status packet of some kind. Um, that in itself might not be useful. What's useful to me is not only is that a status packet or a heartbeat packet as we're calling it, but there's something counting that status packet. And it took us a little bit longer in the presentation to get there for the purpose of we're going in order 
um, from the first bite to the all the way to the, the last bite of that second payload. Yeah. And that that makes sense. But there's always like different ways, right, to arrive to to these conclusions. Yeah, there's there's no right or right, wrong way to do this. We're we're just providing a a, a systematic approach that uh, we've used and, and seen that it's worked. Now, thank you so much for your comments, right? Everybody's like, wow, this is amazing, amazing concepts. Thank you so much. I'm just going to pick one more question. I know there's more, but please follow us on Twitter, right? Uh, um, you know, feel free to ask us questions there, and we will be answering those, like, you know, during the day. Uh, that's that's not a problem. But I'm going to pick one last one. Is most of ICS OT SCADA traffic today still unencrypted? Is that what you find, Doug, in, in your uh, research? Uh yeah, so of course encryption is something that we didn't have time to cover today. Uh, there's all different ways to identify encryption and, and work around that as well. Uh, but the question is, is that what we mostly find? And I would say for the most part, yeah, I, I largely see that IoT systems, ICS systems, uh, most of those niche devices, medical devices, a lot of that stuff is, is still unencrypted. It might not be using something you recognize, um, but we, we don't see a ton of encryption in there. Awesome. All righty. Well, uh, the time is over, and, and I'm so glad that we had so many questions and so much interest uh, that, that motivates us to probably, you know, yeah, absolutely, more. it's great. Keep sharing. We have, uh, you know, we didn't have the time to share that. We have a ton more material that we could have shared on on this. Uh, but yeah, follow us on Twitter. Uh, engage with us. I'm gonna bring it back to Jessica to wrap it up. Thank you so much. Uh, all yours, uh, Jessica. All right. Well, thank you to both of our speakers, Ishmael and Doug, for that great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. Thank you.